So let's get started. Um, I'm going to do this in English, which is kind of unusual to have an Italian speaker that also helps the organization, but gives this sort of uh, constraint. I told them, I'm going to come, I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak about what I do, but I'm not going to do it in Italian. Because, um, uh, first of all, for me it's easier. So, being a super lazy person, this was the only way to do it. But also because uh, the little struggle that may you have in following me on this um, is something that I had in the past when I was trying to, um, when I was working and living in Italy, trying to get through to the international community. It was a struggle to follow them in another language. But every single piece of effort that I put into that um, was able to bloom later on and give me and gave me a lot of opportunities. So to encourage you to get those opportunities, I want you to struggle a little bit today. Uh, our journey today starts in 1986, which is not my year of birth, because I was born six years before that, but with this picture. So this is my mom, and this is me, six years old. And this is a place that many of you might know because if you are into uh, bicycle racing or if you're just passionate about mountains, you know that in Italy we have Stelvio and Passo dello Stelvio, which is a pass through two mountains in the Alps. And it's very popular because for people who ride bikes, it's one of the, it's one of the uh, place to go. It's one of the uh, biggest challenge, being able to climb up this road with your bike. It's a challenge that an experienced biker wants to do at least once. Yeah, it's true, there are also motorbikers that they do that, but that is easy, do that with a bike. And my mom did that. In 1986, she trained for more than 10 months. She was very passionate about bikes. She trained for more than 10 months, and then uh, she was able to go uphill here. Uh, it took her four and a half hours. I was with my dad in the car, very comfortable, even at that time, and, uh, and she made it. And then we took that picture. So after that, coming from a family of passionate bikers, my mom was a biker, um, my grandfather uh, was a biker, my uncle still is a biker today, very passionate about it. I had this idea that maybe there was a chance that I could make it too and, and start riding a bike. And I was six, so it was like that age where you, uh, you start learning uh, running a bike. And I had my little bike with side wheels, you know, the, the side wheels. And I decided to take them off. So I asked my grandfather, he took, he unscrewed the wheels, and there I went with the bike without wheels for the first time. And of course, what happened? I fell many times to the point that I said, you know what, not that sure this is my thing. And it's true, even if I learned how to run a bike, at some point for me, bikes are very, very interesting objects that they can decorate your apartment really well. They're really nice to see at, they're really nice to ride, but for sure, they are not my job. And my job uh, developed over the years, started in Italy, then uh, I, went, I crossed the border, I started joining international companies, and uh, at the beginning of 2014, I joined Automatic which is the company behind many of, behind all of them, but also more products that you may know or you may use. Uh, we are behind WordPress.com, we're behind Akismet, we're behind Jetpack, we're behind Woo, uh, WooCommerce, and uh, we do our best to make the web a better place. And uh, one of the things that is well known about Automatic is that we don't have meetings. Why we don't have meetings? Well, because we don't have offices, because we live everywhere. So all of my colleagues, including me, we don't have a place where we go every morning except the online facilities that we have, which is Slack, WordPress, and other tools that we use to keep connection, keep us connected, but we don't go to the office because our life is fully distributed. So everybody works from home, wherever home is. So this is a map of us. Uh, if, if you go on automatic.com, you can see this map, it's interactive, and you can see where everybody lives. Of course, we have higher density in Europe and North America, but we, are, we can call ourselves a global company. And we love to work asynchronously, so it doesn't, we don't need others to be awake at the same time and to be in contact with us with video calls or 
um, real-time chats all the time because most of our work happens to be asynchronous. So I do my work, I just submit my work, and others will take over uh, later on when they wake up because we have many, many different time zones. Uh, we also have an open vacation policy. It means that all of us can just go on holiday whenever we like and how long we want to. We don't, have, we don't count how many days of vacation we take every year. And also, we don't uh, have a check-in and check-out time every day. So it's, I don't have to start at 8 or 9. I start when I want, and I stop when I want. So what happens? That sometimes you do something, and then you just wait for someone else to be online, because it's not online at the same time. Sometimes it takes a few days, because that person is on holiday. And of course, his schedule is on the calendar. You know about it. but. Uh, you know, in a traditional office, you're more into, I need you, come by, let's see each other, let's work on something together at the same desk. And we expect the kind of um, interactive uh, waste of time, which happens most of the time in an office. We don't have that. We just keep on working and rely on the fact that someone else will show up. And the first day that you join the company, this is the message that you get. It's the very first message that is on top of the field guide. The field guide is a super large doc document, made, of course, on a WordPress blog, that uh, tries to answer all the questions that a newcomer has, from how do I take vacations, or how do I communicate with my teammates, or how do we do things, or where do I find the cool t-shirts that all my colleagues have, all that stuff is in a big, giant blog with all the answers. And if an answer is not there, and you find out, uh, and you find it out somewhere else, you are encouraged to contribute to that blog to provide more documentation for for uh, the people that are coming next. But the first thing you have on that blog is this: "Welcome to the chaos," because uh, it is it is what it is. You join a company that has so many differences from the traditional work that at the very beginning feels really complicated to melt with. Uh, I was coming from a complete different experience. My boss, actually my business partner before, wanted all of us to be in the office, no matter the type of work we were doing. And I was used to that. Even if I was a free spirit for a long time, the last couple of years before Automatic, I was working in an office. Where I, because it was a startup, I developed my career in a direction that was this, growth methodologies. So today I'm going to disclose a little bit what I'm doing. So Georgia will be happy, Karim will be happy. My mother hopefully will be happy because that happens, I mean, you say a year ago, my mom is asking since that day, what do you do? Because she's not clearly aware of what I'm doing. Uh, she just knows that I'm happy with it and it's enough for a mother. Um, so today I'm gonna show you actually what I do. Um, and I wanna talk about this struggle that I had when I joined Automatic. It was a positive struggle, don't get me wrong. But I was coming from a very structured type of work, um, and I had to implement a very structured type of work in a coding environment where there are no timelines, when there are no deadlines, and everything happens just because the people are really cool and they really cooperate together. So uh, what is growth? Because we hear this word a lot. However, like many of the words that we use, they tend to be very broad in their meaning. So for everybody, it's a different thing. And sometimes they're not very precise in the description of what is the real work behind. That helps me, for instance, to, be, um, to apply to many different conferences with different talks. But I just put growth in the title, and everybody's set, right? Not exactly. But growth for me is this. And for my team and for my company is optimizing the product market fit. What does it mean? Having a company with so many products and dealing with so many clients, because everybody that has a blog on WordPress.com is potentially our client, not a customer, because most of the time it's for free, not a user, because I deeply reject the idea of calling the people on WordPress.com users. It's wrong. We should never use the term user outside of specific uh, part of the design, because otherwise we tend to feel that they, we produce, they use. The reality is they have a life, and they want to improve their life. And our job is to make their life better. This is my job, making our people better, like making their life better. It happens internally, so I help 
other people within the company to have better processes, but most of my work is to make sure that our people that are using our services, they have today a better service than they had yesterday, and tomorrow will be better than today. So a continuous improvement of their experience. It happens through business analytics, what many of us know as Google Analytics. How many of you know Google Analytics? What do you use Google Analytics for? What is the main purpose? Just brag with other people about the visits, right? Google Analytics is one of the many tools that you can use for, for business analytics, knowing that it's offering a very, very narrow amount of information on a specific set of uh, key metrics of your business. Google Analytics is not telling you a lot of things. But the few things that it's telling you, if you're able to read them right, they can really, really improve the quality of your outcome. Of course, it's not the final goal. As many of the tools that we use, it's one of the things that contribute to the success of your business. Then another thing that I do daily is this, split testing and usability testing. I submit our design to real people, that they use it, they show me they struggle in using it, and I feed back to the designers in order to get them better. I also do split testing. This happens really every day, where I send different uh, groups of people through different type of experiences, measuring the key metrics to decide which new feature is better, which design works better. Not necessarily gets uh, more visits or gets more sales, but according to the business analytics, uh, to the metrics that we measure through business analytics and the goal that we have, we use these tools to make sure we are going in the right direction. And then the entire thing that happens before is focused on one and one thing only, making data-informed decisions. Most of the time, most of the decisions we make as a human beings are wrong, deeply wrong. It happens at personal level when we choose the people we want to spend our life with, many, many of us know. When we choose uh, the food we're going to eat tonight, when we choose the restaurant, when we choose the, the next car, and in business, when we choose the next partner, the next feature on our, on our website, the next design on our website. When we say, oh, you know what? I really feel that this is going to work. When you hear this sentence, for sure it's wrong. My job? is to tell you how much big is that for sure. Because I know that it's wrong. I just don't know the extent. And my job is to find it out and tell you, look, this gives us 95% of chances to be right. This one gives us 10%. The potential outcome of this is this amount. The potential outcome of the other is this amount. Am I making the decision? Sometime. Sometimes it happens that I am supposed to decide what to do. Most of the time, I just present the thing to the decision makers. And the decision makers, try, they can make a decision that is based on the goal, on the vision, on the strategy, and on my data-informed uh, metrics, actually, on, my, on the metrics that I provide in order to be informed. Because the point is not about making the right one. The point is, is to limit the amount of risk compared to the outcome that you want to get. How do we do that? Well, of course, this is science. Totally science, right? And we know that science requires to be strict. You cannot just make uh, science if you are not strict on the process. Otherwise, it's not science. It's just voodoo or very, very uh, uh, similar to magic. Or sometimes it's just stuff that doesn't work. You need to be strict. So the struggle was, how do I take street methodologies and apply on a chaotic company? Not an efficient, not slow company. Really fast, really efficient, but very chaotic. There was to be applied with methodologies that are sometimes very slow. Sometimes it takes me two months to get an answer. And I have people that they work on that and they need an answer today. Sometimes the answer requires that something doesn't change for those two months. And things are changing every five minutes. We have more than 100 deployments per day on WordPress.com. My colleagues submit code on a continuous pace. 
They don't stop for two months because I need to measure something. I need to figure out a way to measure it, even if things are changing in the meanwhile. That was my, that was my thing to do. Uh, and this is my team. Uh, you see five people here. This is our recent meetup in Vienna a few weeks ago. So uh, this is Bree. She lives in San Diego. This is Mike. He lives in Richmond, Virginia. This is Dan. He lives in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Ron. He lives in Tel Aviv, Israel. And this is me. I live in Vienna, Austria. As you can see, we go from Tel Aviv time to San Diego time. And we never, we're never awake at the same time altogether. We have a window that covers 20 hours per day because Ron wakes up, then I wake up, six, five, six eight hours later, they wake up, and then Bree wakes up last in a day, and we cover the entire uh, clock. So I know that if I have activities to do that require just me, so they're like solo work, I do them in the morning because the others are sleeping except Ron. But if I need to do something that requires to work with my lead, which is Brie, I need, to wait, I need to wait for Pacific time. So I tend to push that later in the day after 4 or 5 p.m. to make sure that we are efficient with that. And we have these three uh, things that I'm going to talk to you today. These are three things that we do. We don't talk about it. We just do it. First one is a weekly sprint. The second one is a weekly growth hangout. And the other one is our meetup projects. So let's start with the first one, a weekly sprint. How many of you are familiar with a sprint methodology? OK, what, what happens? In our case, every week we just talk. So we take one hour, sometimes even less. The fastest, the fastest hangout about a sprint we had was like 12 minutes. We try to keep it as short as possible. Remember, if you want to make sure, if you want to measure the efficiency of a meeting, the shorter, the better. Because it means that you did homework before. If you sit in a meeting and the meeting goes long, it's a waste of time. Be not because it's just long, but because it means that a lot of things that had to be sorted out before, it never happened. And so you didn't do your homework. So we have this weekly hangout where we just sit, we talk, and we plan next week. We just report about the previous week. It lasts for half an hour usually, and this is the main tool that we use to keep track of what we do. It's a Trello board. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with Trello, right? How many of you? Good. So uh, these are the things that we do. And this, of course, it, well, this is a screenshot of yesterday's Trello. So if you're squinting your eyes trying to read, haha, I change every single title. But I change it with, with cool stuff, like design a beautiful flower. These two are designers. Or design a logo, another designer. In my case, solve a, Ru a Rubik's Cube. Or revision revisions, make sure to be sure. So, you know, I cannot really disclose what we do in detail, but this is how it looks like. But what I want you to, s to look at is this. This is our size chart, the same way we measure shirts, right? You have extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. For us, tasks that end up in a card on our Trello, they need to be extra small, so tasks that we estimate they're going to last less than two hours to be completed, small, less than one day, medium, less than two days, there is no large, there is no extra large, there is no special, there is no task that is allowed to be bigger than two days. Because with a weekly sprint, if you have something that lasts longer than that, it's a liability. As soon as you put that on your, on your task list, it's a threat for the entire team. Because if someone is stuck on something that is supposed to last three days, it's going to take five days. And you have one resource completely locked for a week. And we cannot afford that. So everything that is bigger needs to be broken down in pieces that are smaller than that. So everything needs to be smaller than two days. It's our job to figure out how to break things down in order to be smaller chunks. So we can consume those chunks and make sure that the entire in progress and current spring is completely done by the end of Friday. Of course, sometimes is the end of is mid Saturday because of the time zone, but it doesn't matter. The idea is this 
current spring that starts on uh, Sunday evening or uh, Monday morning for us is completely done by the end of the week. If it's not, what happens? The next time we have a hangout, we discuss why it didn't happen. Then we have a weekly growth hangout that works roughly the same. It's not the same people. There are other people from other teams because we support growth on other teams as well. And uh, what happens on a growth hangout, which I am responsible for, are three things. And they happen in a very strict time frame. So 10 minutes to discuss recent test results. Why 10 minutes? Because a discussion, if it's longer, needs to happen on a written form on a blog where we discuss things and things can be compounded and documented. We don't want to waste, as Karim said before, our time talking about something that then when the call is over, everybody forgets. We discuss future test proposals. We discuss and we have general discussion. During the general discussion, which is a 10 minute sharp, we actually iterate on the process itself. So we just change this process itself because the company changes really fast. We hire really fast. We grow really fast. We cannot afford to have this growth hangout to get stuck for more than two months in the same format. Because in those two months, we learn that there are things that, are, that needs to be done better. And so everything keeps on evolving with the company and with the business along the way. And this is our testing board. Every single test ends up on this board where people contribute with ideas that can be tested. Then we have a list of the tests that are almost ready or ready to be deployed. The tests that are running, like uh, less typos in our copywriting or uh, more CTAs, ROIs, RPUs, but less acronyms. And then uh, I'm going to rush through this because I don't want to go too, uh, too long. But as, as all the other speakers, I'll be available if you want to talk about it. I'm here all day. Then we have meetup projects. We live in different time zones. We live in different countries. Once a year, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, we get together and we spend an entire week together. And during that week, we pick a project and we just work on that project together. And the last one is this. So this is a book that I highly encourage you to buy and to read. It's called Sprint and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's recently, it recently was featured by Google Ventures, well, actually comes out of Google Ventures. And it's a guide that in five days takes you from, takes a design team from zero to a prototype tested. So how to develop new products or services or businesses in five days. It's really, really interesting. You should try it. The first thing you need into the book is to have a lot of post-its, a lot of stickers, a lot of paper, and a lot of pens. And you know, you give designers this thing and they can just cover the entire uh, place with that. It's just amazing by itself. But truth is that if you follow that book, you have very precise time slots where you are supposed to design for 10 minutes, design, discuss for five. And it gives you like, uh, on five days, it gives you like uh, 10 sessions, half a day each. You just follow that the first time, it's awkward. From the second time, you start to get momentum and get speed, and it's amazing. You should really try it. So during this thing, you create a blueprint of your next product or your next service. In our case, of course, we were not designing this, but this is a pretty cool uh, thing because at the end, you actually make it to create an MVP, so a prototype of the product that, of course, you're supposed to try. And like every single time it happens, it's going to fail miserably. And that is the entire point, because that is the right time to fail, not when you go to market. Fail as soon as possible. And this design sprint helps you to fail on the right things, those things that you can fix and get better. So this, for instance, it's me, Mike, Dan, and Ron, and Bree was taking the picture. You can see a designer. Uh, so here tells why I'm needed, why this team needs me for doing this kind of stuff. Because a designer is good at designing this, like the product that I was uh, testing with this guy, but he's so embarrassed. And I know that Mike is going to watch this video at some point, and Mike, I'm talking about you. Look how embarrassed was this guy. He was like, I don't know these people. He was just, 
But I, I am good at that. So I went to this guy and I said, this guy was selling tickets outside of the, outside of the opera house, which is not that legal, but they do that. And if you go to Vienna, you have a lot of people that they try to sell you tickets. So my, my, we were looking for p real people to test our prototype. There was a mobile, uh, a, a part of a mobile interface. And I was like, oh, tickets for the opera, let's do this. And, and the guy was like, oh, they're going to buy. So I need to be cooperative. And so I was like, oh, oh, you know, we're designers. We're here uh, designing stuff. Can you try our app? And he was trying the interface. And we were looking at, the, at his usage, so taking notes, like he struggled on this. It was fine on that. Thank you. And we were leaving. And Mike was very embarrassed by our uh, behavior. But we got very useful insights on how real people were interacting with our interface. So in this case, I was the face. I don't know if you know the A-Team, the, the, the TV series from the 80s. I am the face. Uh, in Italian, it was Sberla. OK, in English, it's the face. Uh, so three takeaways from my presentation. And then if you have questions, I would be super happy to answer. Uh, the first thing is make. Do not talk. I lived in New Zealand for a while. And I studied martial arts for more than 20 years. And when I was in, in New Zealand, I had an awesome uh, sensei for Aikido. And every time that people were like stopping their practice and talking about it, were like, oh, you know, my elbow is not going right or my stance, the guy was showing I was like, do not talk about your problems. Solve them. And this is the thing. Every time you have people that they tell you, you know, we should do this, we should do this, just do it. Do it. Because the first time you do it is not going to work out. No matter what, you can talk about it. You can talk for months. The first time you do it, it's not going to work out. So just do it. And then learn. Take notes on what is not working. Do not talk about what you, what you don't think is working. Just reflect on what is really not working because of the experience you did, you made doing something. And then even if it feels really awkward, you should get it wrong and then learn about it. And then keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Iterate. Change little things a lot of times. Not, let's do this for three months, then in three months we're going to talk about it, and then in another three months maybe we change it. No. We talk about this every week, and if we learn something this week, next week is going to be already different. Every single thing, including the iteration process itself, needs to be put into an iteration process. So when we talk about growth, we have this saying, up and right. Because when things go well on your chart, they go up and right. We actually have an internal blog where we discuss growth that is called up and right. However, uh, it's, not right. it's not right. It's not up and right. It's a lot of stuff happens before you can go up and right. And if you look at the real path that success and growth take, it reminds me something doesn't it? Oh, yes. It reminds me something. My mom didn't spend 10 months talking with friends about, you know what is really needed to get on top? She trained every single day for 10 months with a six years old pain in the ass that was me at home to get to the top. And that is the only way to do it. And when you think that growth methodologies that you see on books or people like me that talk about it, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but they apply only to automatic. They only apply only to Google. They only apply only to crowd favorite or big companies. That is not true. They apply all the time. They apply in personal life, on a small shop, on a one-person consultancy business, on a large corporation. They just work. But you need to remember something. It's like bikes. There are people that are in their life, they make a career becoming professional bikers and they do Giro d'Italia, Tour de France, and they make a living out of it. Then there are other people that they just go to work with their bike, and they just don't buy a car because they have their bike, and the bike is more than fine to go to work and come back. There are people that they use their bike on Sunday just to take a stroll outside of the, of the city, or they go on holiday and they just go by bike, or they use it for other purposes, or they run in a cycle. So the purpose of the bike is different for everybody. But learning how to ride the bike is the same for everybody. So don't worry about looking at what other people do with the bike. Just make sure that you understand the, bas the basics, fail enough to learn how to ride the bike, and that, is well, that will accompany 
your life for the entirety for, for the entire life you will know how to learn your bike even if for a while you you take another job when you go back you know how to run the bike and the bike is to have an iterative process that allows failures that lowers the cost of failure and makes things to change every day do not wait for change just drive it so thank you very much i really appreciate And I would really appreciate your questions. I'm sure you have, unless we are super late. No, we're not late, right? We are in time. We have one question there. Yeah. What's the MC doing? It's just like hanging around, huh? Please. Okay. Hi. Uh, you can ask, sorry, if I interrupt you. You can ask me in Italian and English. I will repeat the question in English in any way, and I will answer in English. If you want to do Italian to Italian, we do it afterwards. Just for the video, I want to keep the answers in English. Okay. So. Thanks for everything. This kind of uh, moving around the job is, is huge. I like it. Uh, just a, a small consideration. Yeah. Uh, this looks great for uh, long-term projects or always evolving projects. But how about uh, web agencies with small terms um, projects and so always starting again a new project a new project and not yep. thinking about it. that's that's a great question because that allows me to help you understand the scope of this do not see your business as the bite or your next customer your business is not the current customer and it's not the next customer your business is the entire life of your agency, your shop, of your company. And that is the scope that you need to take. A client, it's a little window in a very long time. But that little window compounded with all the others, they make your living over time. So it's not about growing or iterating a lot on a single client, but every client itself is a new iteration on negotiation, sales, uh, support, there was a problem, one client will teach you for the next one. And this is the thing I really encourage you to do. Take every single bit of failure as a learning for the next one, but not with, with an attitude that is like, I know they do this, oh, I know this happens, oh yeah, and the one that I really hate, and I hope I'm not offending anyone. If I do, I apologize. No, I don't even apologize. If I offend you, you are wrong on this. Never, promise me, never use ever again the sentence, well, but this is Italy. Cut that shit. It's your business. It's your responsibility to change this. If a client is not behaving the way it's supposed to, it's your job to change that. The country is not going to change by itself, and we are responsible for it. So the first thing to do is never say that sentence again. Never justify yourself or someone else saying, yeah, but this is the way it is. No, this is the way you keep it. Is that clear? Good, I'm happy about myself. I told, I told him yesterday. So. So I told him yesterday that I should start a political party, which is not going to happen. I know that other people with microphones said that a lot of times and that it happened. I have no plans for that. So you find my thing out, you can sign. No, I'm kidding. Uh, more questions, please. Just another one. Yeah. Okay. I, I have two questions. I'll just make one. Okay. Yeah. One is about you. Uh, so what's the best uh, grow, I mean, success in terms of growth in an automatic that you did just to contextualize your, your work. Okay, so uh, last year we went for an, ex for an extraordinary journey at Automatic. We started one thing called Calypso that many of you might have heard about. Um, it's a new way of interacting with WordPress. And in our case, in, it's very deep con deeply connected with WordPress.com. Calypso gave us a new framework in terms of technological framework. So there were new ways to uh, write the user interface, new ways to interact with the backend. 
And at some point, we realized at the very beginning of the year, actually a little before last year, that uh, one of the goals that the company had for the year was to improve the new user experience, so the sign-up process. I didn't work directly on new user experience for the entire year. Was not, I was not in charge of it. I was involved, sometimes marginally, sometimes I was asked questions, sometimes I was consulting other teams, sometimes I was just passing by and I was saying, if I may, I would do this and that. So it's not my personal success because in Automatic, there are no Lucas successes. There will never be Lucas successes because it's not about me, it's about the company. And whatever I do, I do it to support others in reaching the goals of the company. In that case, being able, even in a, little, in a little contribution, to push a culture of data-informed decisions, testing, iterating, and um, getting data as one of the main components for decisions helped the company to go from a, a let's say, conversion rate in sign-up that was a little above 30% to 50% on a specific flow in the company. And that was big because it was a new user experience. So everybody that was starting a new account went through, uh, was, was involved with this. Uh, so of course I'm not going into details on which flow in particular or the size of it, but that to me was a big, uh, was, I was really proud of that. Not just because I was involved, because as I told you, I was not directly involved, but I know that I contributed to the attitude towards that in order to get that done. And that is enough for me to be extremely proud of what the company does uh, at every level, because that happens not just on new user experience, but uh, also on engagement, on reduction of churn. There are many business challenges that companies of that size have, and uh, I'm really happy to be there and contribute. Was that? Yeah. Okay, cool. I would take the la very last one, and then we move into private Q&A outside if you may, if you want. I don't know if you can talk about this, but I'm curious about um, an example of a work day for you since you have this. Oh, I don't work. <laughs> that, is, that is a decision I made a long time ago. Now I'm, I'm 36 and it's too late to start, so no. Uh, but it's true, I don't. I don't feel myself I'm working. I am just, uh, I'm just happy enough and I was very, very uh, uh, skilled and smart, smart enough to get someone to pay me for having a hobby. And it's real. I don't feel I go to work because I don't go to work, but my, my usual day goes like this. I, when I'm in Vienna, when I'm traveling, every day is different. But when I'm in Vienna, I structure the day uh, to make sense uh, for my team and for myself. And I wake up around 7.30 or 8. I go to the gym, two, two hours in at the gym. So around 10.30, 11. I open my computer uh, and then I go through everything that happened during the night because all the American shift happens when here is night. So I just go through uh, internal blogs, emails, everything that requires me to be informed about what happened the day before around 11 in the morning. And then from 11 to I would say 1 or 12.30, I just process that chunk of information that some days are really big, some days is a little smaller, and I do all the activities that requires my solo attention. So uh, preparing tasks or doing analytics, doing things that do doesn't require me to talk to others. And that happens before lunch and after lunch around until 3, 3.30, when the three Americans tend to show up. When the three Americans show up, it's time to interact and to do that work that requires interaction. So let's say that I have a piece of code that requires design, so I can interact with designers and get it done because we are up at the same time. If I need something to go through my team lead, the team lead comes around three or four usually, sometimes before, uh, and that is the right time to interact with them. So I prepare A-B tests, I prepare usability tests, I review the test, I keep all the key metrics in line because when you test, you test something new, but don't forget that this is a big company with a lot of key metrics, and a lot of them are called health metrics. It means that if everything goes well, like you have, but you have revenue that they fall, that there is a problem. So everything, every single health metric needs to be on my dashboard and my desktop every, every moment of my workday. So as I said, 11 to 2 p.m., 3 p.m., solo time. 
3 p.m. to 6, interaction. Then I take time off until 8 or 9, depending on the plans for the evening. Usually before, uh, after dinner, I just check in again to make sure that everything is on the launch pad for the night. What, what I mean, uh, sometimes, uh, let's say a designer needs to work on something. I cannot afford that that designer cannot work during my night because I forgot to prepare enough for him to, to do it. So after dinner, I just make sure that everything is ready to be taken over by someone else that comes in when I'm sleeping. And that keeps the wheel spinning. When I'm traveling, I try to adapt. So uh, I try to keep this even if in a different time zone. But the thing is, I work with extremely capable people. And um, that means that even if I forgot something, they ping me on Slack, I just, two words, they know already where to go, what to get. And my job is to make sure that I, I'm never a bottleneck for anything. So my day can be extremely flexible. And then there are days where I am all in for the entire day, and there are days that I say, sorry, it's contributor's day tomorrow, I need to take it off, and there is no problem, because there is a Saturday, a Sunday, and then a Monday, and I will catch up on things. Uh, the most important thing is to keep this wheel spinning all the time, and making sure that when, when you have other things to do, those things do not stop this wheel that spins. Uh, but most of all, being able to rely on others. And this is not easy. Um, it took me a while to get used to do not rely just on myself, because that is the most difficult part. And to do that, you really need to completely delete your ego. There's never, I do this. There's always, we do this. There is never personal success. There is always team success, company success, even before. So that requires requires quite some time. But uh, I got there. Or at least I'm getting there. I'm not here yet, there yet completely. But uh, I'm happy about it. And I'm super happy that you have been here for such a long time. I don't want to keep you any longer. There's lunch.